as we continue this series about the three angels' message. Our, our focus this evening is on worship. Worship as proclaimed in the first angel's message. A very fascinating topic. And as I often do, I like to go to the dictionary to simply define a word. Look at what the dictionary, how the dictionary defines a particular word. And worship in the dictionary functions as a noun and as a verb. And as a noun, the definition is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. And as a verb, the definition is all about showing reverence and adoration for a deity. So as a noun, it's the feeling or expression of, and as a verb, it's showing that reverence, that adoration. One of my favorite authors and speakers, theologians, John Piper. And I came across his statement about worship. He's got a number of lengthy articles books about worship, but this particular statement jumped out at me. True worship is a valuing or treasuring of God above all things. Valuing or treasuring of God above all things. Now, worship itself really begins in an inner sense, in an inner essence. That's, that's where it begins inside us. And some of you know that Bob Dunn is the one that married Darla and me, It'll be 32 years next week. And on an anniversary, our first anniversary that fell on a Sabbath, he was the guest speaker at the Hamilton Church. And I remember his message, and, and Bob wasn't one to stay at the pulpit, but as he walked around the, the sanctuary, talking to us and his message that day was about worship and he said we don't go to church to worship you take your worship with you and that just resonated in my mind as i thought about this topic of worship for this evening and how it begins on our inner essence of us and then it works out to the more public expressions of worship services and daily acts of love and and I looked for some slide that I could kind of just show worship and it's a slide there is, is somewhat generic but you know there are just so many different forms of worship so many different styles of worship services but it all starts with the inside us we take our worship there and as Paul talks about worship, he calls this our spiritual worship. It's our expressions of worship services, our daily acts of love. Romans 12, 1, he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, as we look at the first angel, what the first angel proclaimed this, in this heavenly message, that proclamation is to resonate throughout the world, urgently appealing to all to fear God, to give glory to God, and to worship the creator, Revelation 14, 7. But worship takes us to the core of this cosmic conflict. And are we, we are living in a conflict right now. And this, this cosmic conflict, worship takes us right there. And it's challenging us to worship the creator and not the fallen cherub, whose intent is to permanently dis dislodge God from a portion of his creation. Now, in the conflict, in this cosmic conflict, worship becomes the acid test. And you've heard that expression, and there are tests. So to think of an acid test, an acid test is a conclusive test of the success or value of something. And if you think of that in relationship to worship, and 
fear God, give glory to God and worship the creator. Worship really is the acid test of how we, what our relationship is to our creator. The Greek verb translated to worship is found in Revelation 14, seven, I'm not going to try and pronounce the word, but that Greek verb to worship literally means to bow down or prostrate oneself. And when that's applied to humans, that really designates an act of homage. But when God is the object, that verb now designates that the bending down of both the body and the inner being as an expression of the dislodging of our fallen self in order to find in him this wholeness of being, the center and goal of our life. Now, as we talk more about this, this word, this topic of worship, there are two very important attitudes of worship that we want to talk about here this evening in the next few minutes. And the first one is worship as a confession of faith. Revelation 4.11, before the throne of God, heavenly beings fall down and worship God, declaring, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. They confess that they worship God, the creator, and they invite humans to join them in worship. And it's an act of worship. It's fundamentally a confession of faith in God, whom we declare to be our creator. Now, this confession of faith is through the spirit. It is deeply rooted in our inner being and is verbalized through word and through action and the bending of self in absolute submission. In fact, worshiping the creator has much to do with life, for he, God, is the source of life. It's a really interesting perspective on this. Consequently, then, worship is being at home, for we are in the presence of our Father. Worship, being at home, we're in the presence of our Father. And it's our Father who, through a loving act of creation, he gives us life. And that's why the Bible explains that only those who are alive can praise the Lord. You see, it's creative life that sees the one who is life and bows down in gratitude and love before him. Now it's this type of worship. It's not something we do occasionally, but it is life that lives constantly in the presence of the Lord. It's an attitude that we have all the time and that walks humbly before him. Now John also sees heavenly beings fall down before the lamb and worship declaring Revelation 5, 9, worthy are you, the lamb, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Worthy are you. And men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Worship is a confession of faith in Christ, who as redeemer has made us new creatures. And redemption assumes that God's original creation was damaged by the fallen cherub, and that humans drifted away from home. And where is home? What did I just share with you? Where is home? Worship is being at home, for we are in the presence of our Father. And then the Son of God descended to a planet of self-centered creatures to bring them back home to their source of life. Lost life restored to us through Christ's saving work, confesses before the universe that he is our redeemer by bending our fallen self before him in grateful worship. And then we move to this confession of loyalty. Loyalty. Well, worship is really a confession of loyalty to God as our creator and our redeemer. Yes, I thought about the word loyalty as we go shopping different stores and online you know they like the these retailers they like repeat business and they figure out some clever ways to keep you coming back to them 
tracking in the form of points or dollars spent cards, all the little keychain cards that you can scan. And it's all about staying inside and doing most of your business with that store and keeping you away from the others. But loyalty and worship is taking God's side in the cosmic conflict. And consequently, it is an act of rebellion against the powers of evil. And because of this loyalty to God's side, we're doing our best to stay away from the powers of evil. Reminds me of, the, of Daniel and his three friends. And you know the story of Daniel and his three friends. The followers of the Lamb are not intimidated by the dragon. And since creatures do not possess life in themselves, they are incapable of preserving their own life, much less the life of other creatures. Therefore, worshiping the fallen cherub as an expression of loyalty to him is really choosing death. And it's God's loyal people who have this perseverance of the saints and who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. We'll go more in depth than that in our church service on Sabbath. Worshiping God as creator and redeemer is manifested in their life by persevering in their obedience to God's commandments and in keeping their faith in Christ as redeemer. This is really interesting here. The commandments, as we see them mentioned in Revelation, are primarily referring to the Decalogue back in Exodus 20. When we look in verse 7 of Revelation 14, we see this call to worship God is an, excuse me, is an invitation to obey the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the warning not to worship the image of the beast invites us to keep the second commandment, verse 9, second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And the condemnation of the beast for speaking blasphemies against God's name requires obedience to the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And then we come to the imperative to worship God, imperatives. That's a word, a strong word to stress the importance of worshiping God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And it uses the language and the ideas that are found in that fourth commandment, the fourth commandment that is so special to us, pointing to its importance for the question of whom to worship. And reading from the great controversy, she writes, had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the creator as the object of reverence and worship. And there would have never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. Had the Sabbath been universally kept. Well, the Sabbath, it's not only a memorial of creation, but it's a memorial of the one who, through Christ, created everything. And it's indispensable for the dragon to set aside this memorial permanently. And that explains how the Sabbath question will be the issue in the great conflict in which all the world will act apart. Now, at the present time, the rejection of the Sabbath commandment takes at least two basic forms. The first comes from apostate Christianity. Apostate Christianity through the dismissal of the seventh day as the biblical Sabbath and that promotion of Sunday observance. And the second comes from the world, the study of natural sciences. So we have apostate Christianity and academia and we see the rejection of the Sabbath commandment in those. While well, the theory of natural evolution removed from the consciousness of many scientists and other scholars the existence of a transcendental and yet personal creator, God. 
and I'm sure you have, or most of you have at some point in time, you've talked to someone who is who believes in evolution, or even though they believe in evolution, they still try to tie it in some way with believing in God. But it really removes from the consciousness, it really it separates this very important aspect here of our personal creator God and the Sabbath as the memorial of the creator and how that can be so easily ignored. And according to them, the evolutionist, there is no creator, there is no need for him because everything we see is the result of random and purposeless natural processes. Many Christians have tried to harmonize this natural evolution along with the Christian faith and they argue that God created well, through a long evolutionary process consisting of struggle, suffering, and survival and death. It was a long process, but God did that. That's how they try to harmonize that. And this God did not resemble at all the loving biblical God who is creator and redeemer. It is in this context that the first angel calls all to worship God because it is a matter of life or death. Now, as we conclude this, you think about the conflict. The conflict is on this cosmic conflict. We've used that term a number of times over the last few days. The cosmic conflict is on, and the fundamental concern is clearly identified, and that is who is worthy of worship? Who? There's only one answer, only one answer, only God who, who through Christ created everything and through the Lamb redeemed us, that's who is worthy of worship. And it's only the very fountain of life that can create and recreate life through redemption. And this we confess to be true as we bow down before God and the Lamb and we worship him. Now, each evening, I give you several questions to reflect on, not necessarily to verbally answer publicly in among us here, but for each of you to reflect on and really think through. And the first one, consider the statement that we had this evening. The act of worship is fundamentally a confession of faith. How can this concept inform our worship? Another question, why is it important to understand the connection between worship and creation? So do you, do you see how the, the two are so intimately tied together? And the, the benefit, the huge value in understanding that connection. And the last one is, how can we creatively and engagingly relate the first angel's message to people living around us who believe in evolution. We all know, we all know someone, perhaps in our own family, that believes in evolution, who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in creation. How can we creatively and engagingly relate this most important first angel's message to those people? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this evening as we have unpacked more of the first angel's message as we've looked at the the eternal gospel and, and fear and we've looked at giving glory to you and now we've looked at what it means to worship you as our creator oh give us an even deeper and better understanding and and just right in our on our hearts the the intimacy of creation and worship and worshiping you and and to even better understand this connection between the two but then lord we pray that as we interact with people around us and whether it's in our workplace or with family or even among fellow church goers help us to understand and recognize how we can creatively and engagingly relate the first angel's message to those people around us lord as we go our different ways here this evening 
as we plan on coming back tomorrow evening, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to come and be on us and just plant these things in our mind that we will become even better Christians and followers of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, tomorrow evening, our topic is the gospel vanquishes.